Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. These are real security issues that need to be solved. It's really important to be able to provide resources so that the community can create. Doing this work is what keeps me going. Today on Spotlight, an emergency room physician gets a visit from her guardian angel that helps shape her life. Plus, a cutting-edge cybersecurity device created by a local company is getting national attention. And then how two venues are inspiring the community to be more creative. But first, Greater St. Louis Inc.'s Jason Hall talks about his 2030 jobs plan. It's Sunday and you're watching the Emmy Award-winning Spotlight. St. Louis has built an exceptional support system to empower entrepreneurs and small businesses to reach their potential. This is a huge, meaningful, and globally significant economy, a terrific base to build from. And through the work of Greater St. Louis Inc. and our partners, we are actively out there recruiting new businesses into this market. Jason Hall is leading the charge to take St. Louis to a new phase of economic growth with an unbridled enthusiasm for the region and a practical outlook on the current state of affairs. There is kind of a negativity about St. Louis's future. There's a feeling that, oh, just shut off the lights and lock the doors. St. Louis is done business-wise. Yeah. You have some figures that point just the opposite. This sense of pessimism can be challenging. But let's just level set where St. Louis is at. You know, uh, 15 Fortune 1000, including Bungie, which is listed on the Fortune Global list. Roughly over the last six months, this metropolitan region has produced three or four, depending on how you want to do the math, uh, some debate Round on up. that, billion dollar startups. This is known as a unicorn mm -hmm. uh, when a startup goes public in a, in a, in a billion dollar transaction. And St. Louis is home to that, uh, the most recent of which reported in breaking news in the Wall Street Journal with Benson Hill Biosystems, a great ag tech company led by Matt Crisp, a terrific CEO who moved here several years ago from North Carolina to St. Louis because of the opportunities and the support we had for biotech companies and ag tech companies like his. How big is the St. Louis metro economy? The 15-county bi-state metro in Illinois, Missouri, over $180 billion metro economy. And to put that number in perspective, that is roughly larger than half of the individual states in the United States. The STL 2030 Jobs Plan lies at the heart of Greater St. Louis Inc.'s goals to advance the regional economy to the next level. So the 2030 Jobs Plan brings together a comprehensive view of what we need to do to drive inclusive growth over the next decade. Those five pillars, we got to steward an inclusive economy. It's not going to happen accidentally if we don't come together in collaborative ways to move this forward with a common vision and a common agenda. So in that sense, the creation of Greater St. Louis Inc. was one of the most important things we needed to do under that pillar. We got to restore the core. We know that this metro will only grow if we have a strong urban core. So tremendous work to move that forward. The third pillar, entrepreneurship and small business. It is a strength. We cannot lose focus. We've got to double down. Fourthly, we've got to be a talent engine. Business is attracted to talent. We have tremendous people here. And we want to bring everybody into that pipeline of opportunity. And so that talent pipeline is just absolutely critical. And fifthly, we got to be a global leader in next generation technologies and industries. Those are things like geofutures, geospatial, ag tech, biotech, logistics and transportation. We got to lean in to those areas where we can be globally significant and leverage those strengths for more. When 2030 comes, what is the St. Louis uh, jobs picture going to look like? This is going to be the it city, the metro that's reaching its full potential, 
creating opportunities for all of its residents, known as a great startup community, a great place to do business, where the public and private sector came together in unprecedented and unthinkable ways to say, no longer are we a metro full of potential, but we're a metro reaching our potential. Go to greaterstlinc.com, take a look at that 2030 jobs plan and say, how can I help move these objectives forward in what I'm doing right now today? Sign up for the newsletter so that everybody is armed with the facts to be an ambassador for this region and tell that St. Louis story. And it's also gonna identify new opportunities for people to get engaged very specifically in this work. You know, we're only gonna do this if we come together. And if we all say, that's a direction I can believe in, I can make a difference, and I'm gonna do my part. And when we do that, this Metro is unstoppable. Scan the QR code on your screen to watch the full interview with Jason Hall and learn where St. Louis stands on women-led businesses or visit hecmedia.org. HEC has been bringing you positive programming and award-winning content for decades. Arts, education, culture, in-depth discussions, films, and more. All in one place, hecmedia.org. As a black woman and emergency room physician for more than a decade in an overwhelmingly white and male profession, Dr. Michelle Harper is passionate about the persistent societal issues that impact patients and providers alike. Her memoir is a national bestseller and was included in the New York Times list of 100 notable books of 2020. For today's conversation, Dr. Harper is joined by Dr. Kendra Holmes, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Athenia Healthcare, where she oversees health center operations and serves as the Director of Pharmacy Operations. Dr. Holmes is a recipient of the St. Louis College of Pharmacy Distinguished African American Alumni Award and the St. Louis American Foundation's Excellence in Healthcare Award. One of the images that really struck me in the book that you described so vividly was of you being a little girl and being visited by your guardian angel. And I want to know what that message meant to you and how it caused you to become a, a physician. I grew up, as I discussed in the memoir, with uh, an abusive father who was a batterer. And on this day, though, it was quiet and I was playing with my little ponies and I received a message. I was, I was alone in the room. My mother was upstairs, no one else was in the house, but I heard a voice. Um, I didn't see anyone, but I heard this voice tell me that I would be safe, that my family, and I considered my family, my mother, my brother, my sister, that we would be safe and we would survive. And she went on to say, that I also had to, because I would go on to help many people. And throughout the years, it stayed with me. And it, it's really what buttressed me throughout my childhood, um, even young adulthood, really. Um, and, and as I got older, of course, then I understood the second part of the message, which has been my mission my entire life. Your life's work, yes. Awesome, awesome. So honestly, I simply could not put this book down, just 100%, I, I could not. And as a black woman working in the healthcare industry, I just, your experiences really just spoke to me. So what encouraged you to write this book? In the ER, I, you know, when I'm fortunate, I can help one person at a time, perhaps one family, maybe even one community, but with writing, the potential is so much greater. I mean, that transcends borders. I mean, that's international work potential. So, so that's why I had to do it. There's a lot of distrust, of course, um, in the medical system and uh, with the medical system in mm -hmm. the Black community. What do we do? How do we start to, you know, just dis dismantle that distrust? How do we get the community to be more accepting of, of the medical system? So if the system is trustworthy, then people will trust it. <laughs> so that's, that's absolutely that's true. Oh, well, we have to do. Okay, but of course then that's it, multiple steps involved. I purposely try to work in communities that are um, inner city. I mean, I'm a city girl, so inner city, um, a large percentage of immigrant populations, lower financially resourced, black and brown, because I want to be there 
and it makes a difference if we are. Now, despite my working in these communities, I am also often the only black doctor, which is, it's unfathomable to me because that is completely not representative of the community we're serving. What keeps me going, what gives me hope is doing this work to change it. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out how she lives a life of alignment and the tools she uses to stay focused. Or head to hecmedia.org. HEC Films. Explore. Inspire. Educate and entertain. HEC Films, just one of the many facets of award-winning content you'll find at hecmedia.org. We have to have a machine to, can you see the component? The building blocks of this black box are based in St. Louis. It starts here with QNET security. The St. Louis company claims the black box technology is the next revolution in cybersecurity the oil pipeline, Colonial Pipeline, and the Oldsmar Water. These are real security issues that need to be solved. QNET's Black Box is a new hardware security solution. We are focused on protecting critical national infrastructures. The problem is that a lot of the devices that we're trying to protect, the networks that we're trying to protect, are years if not decades old. So what we did is we came up with something where we can drop into the network and we do it in a way that's provably secure. CEO Ron Index says this is why his company has contracts with the U.S. Army and Air Force. With the U.S. Air Force, that's a $3 million contract in order to protect what they call communications out at the tactical edge. Army providing them a solution for the next generation network. So QNET needed to scale up manufacturing to include this St. Louis product engineering and manufacturing company, Custom Technologies in Brentwood. The black box is hardware for endpoint security. We make sure that everyone, every packet, every piece of information that's trying to get through that device is authenticated. We're inline devices, so the only way you can get through that network is through us. 1500 wind turbine scenario, we would recommend something like 1500 of our boxes to go uh, kind of one to one on those uh, wind turbines. For a, a water system, typically they'll have the water towers that could have many different sensors and pumps and whatever. And we can protect that geographic point of presence with one of our systems. So every time, every place you see a water tower, you could be uh, protecting it or thinking about protecting that from a network attack by a QNET device there. To ensure everything works as it should, the black box prototypes undergo intense environmental testing. We'll put it in for hours, days, or even weeks. Very hot or very cold. INDEC admits nothing is unhackable. That's if a hacker has the money and time on Earth, which is the impossible part. It would require a billion trillion years in order to break our system or to break into the network to get to the endpoints that we're protecting. So then you say, well, maybe this is going to be uh, put together by uh, a state actor that could afford a billion such computers. So you have a, uh, a billion of these computers that work a billion times faster. It would still take a trillion years in order to break our system. This endpoint hardware does not eliminate the need for cybersecurity software. A combined software and hardware-based security approach can help protect vital assets, data and infrastructure. Index says there's a growing need for QNET's black boxes. He has a few models. And this will be more of the uh, consumer or some of the uh, enterprise applications. The hope is for the black box and the intellectual property for the device to become new tools everyone can add to their security arsenal. We can take what we have in here and put it down into a single small chip 
or codified and given to somebody so that they could put it into their chip. So a Samsung refrigerator could then take our stuff, put that security into their system, and it wouldn't be an extra box. It would be already included right into that IoT device. A STEAM-based program for kids, later on Spotlight. So this is the Foundry at Made, an exhibit of all the Foundry artists that are in studio out in St. Charles. And we're showcasing each of their work on our walls here at Made Makerspace. We have a whole variety of different kinds of work. We have pottery, fibers, some really beautiful paintings as well. So it's a little mixed bag of everything that's over at the Foundry. The partnership between the Foundry Art Center and Made Makerspace started in January and they had reached out asking if we wanted to showcase some of our members' work out in their exhibition space. We jumped at the opportunity to show off our community here. We have over 227 makers, artists, designers, and entrepreneurs that we were super excited to show off there. The partnership started with a show of Made at the Foundry here at the Foundry Art Center, uh, highlighting a lot of the artists in their studio spaces and makers and designers uh, in their membership. And from there, we transitioned that into an art exhibition at Made from the Foundry Studio Artists here at the Foundry Art Center. We're really enthusiastic about this show because it showcases not just the partnership, but it showcases the artists and the creativity that's happening here at Foundry. We have very similar missions, uh, basically getting art out into the community through events or just membership uh, and showcasing what it means to be a creative person here in the St. Louis, St. Charles area. Made Makerspace's mission is to support local makers, artists, designers, and entrepreneurs in the St. Louis region. We provide training on and access to a ton of different machines and equipment from woodworking to laser cutting, welding, and more. Our partnership with the Foundry Art Center in St. Charles is really amazing because we get to support even more artists here in our St. Louis region. The Foundry at Made is a show that showcases all of the studio artists here at Foundry Art Center. So we have about 14 different studio spaces here at the Foundry Art Center and what we provide the artists is a uh, inexpensive studio space that artists can come in and create their artwork and be a resource to the community. People can visit the space and go through and see the artists working and answer any questions about what it is that they're doing or what it means to be a professional working artist. It is a great back and forth between the artists and the community. It's really important to be able to provide resources uh, so that the community can create, especially here in St. Louis. We have a ton of creative people here, a whole lot of folks that want to come in, they want to learn how to make the projects that they want to make. Without those resources, those projects don't get made. Design doesn't happen, creativity doesn't happen, and without creativity, we can't have a culture here. That is the importance of creating spaces so that culture can exist on a local level, is so that we can create beautiful, amazing works of art that we can proudly say are from St. Louis. So MADE provides training on and also access to all of the equipment in our shop. It's really difficult as a maker, an artist, a designer, or an entrepreneur to go out and buy your own machines, to find space for it, uh, to be able to learn how to use it yourself. And so we sort of fill that gap so that anybody can come in and learn how to use a laser cutter. Anybody can learn how to use a metal mill. As we were working together with MADE for the MADE at the Foundry and then the Foundry at MADE shows, we began talking about different ways that we can continue the collaborative partnership. And one of the things that came up was the fact that they have a CNC router. And we needed some wood blocks cut for our block party steamroller print event that recently happened. So the folks from the Foundry came out to use MADE Makerspace as members in order to make blocks for their wood block steamrolling event that happened in June and they were able to CNC route out designs that local artists had created. It worked out really well for us because we were able to get the wood blocks cut and uh, just like working with MADE, we reached out to Graphic House to have a collaborative partnership with them. Uh, we were very lucky to have them as partners for the steamroller print. So they ran all of the logistics day of the block party and those types of partnerships enabled us to have a very successful event. MADE is really proud to be exhibiting this exhibition with the Foundry Art Center because we both believe in creating spaces for creativity. We both believe in creating spaces for artists to thrive, to co-create, 
and to have studio spaces and a community that they can access. The Foundry at Maid is going to be up at Maid through August 11th. If you want to come by and see it, we're at 5127 Del Mar, and you can find out more information at maidstl.com. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Hi, my name is Dawn LeGray, and I create a dimensional kaleidoscopic artwork from my own original travel photos from around the US and Europe. So I do cut everything apart with scissors, so they're all cut by hand. Um, and then I layer them back out with foam in between the different layers to create kind of a dimensional representation of the original photo. So while it might not look like the Eiffel Tower, let's say, it still retains the feeling of the Eiffel Tower. And um, one of the great things that I love to talk with people that come into my booth is that, you know, it reminds them of a special vacation or a special memory that they have of being in that place, be it maybe Paris or maybe New York City or someplace like that. So it's just really fun to trade travel stories with my customers. Um, you know, I hear everything from, oh, didn't we have the best breakfast burrito right outside that, uh, you know, church um, to, you know, we shared our first kiss at the top of the Eiffel Tower. So it's just a great way to relive your travel memories on a daily basis. I just also think that it's sort of the mystery behind it. Here is this abstract design, but then once they learn that parts of it are from a photo, they then can start to pick out those elements and they're like, oh, I see how this is that building. You know, this is, oh, this is the arched doorway or something like that. So um, I think it's kind of at a couple of different levels, um, but the design and the symmetry is what kind of pulls people in and then the discovery of the different elements and how it ties back to the subject matter is sort of what keeps people looking. Scan the QR code on your screen to meet more artists that will be at this year's St. Louis Art Fair, September 10th through the 12th. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Inspiring young imaginations to design and be creative. To build and play their self-crafted musical instrument is the heartbeat of the SOLID program. The challenge of SOLID is to create a sound object that produces sound through vibration and is able to change in pitch and volume. SOLID stands for the Science of Learning Instrument Design. It's a STEAM-based program where students go through the full cycle of designing and building, creating and retesting their own musical instruments from recycled materials. One of the things that SOLID does is it relates to teachers and kids with something they know, music and musical instruments. It fosters their creativity and their imagination. There's a lot that they learn. And then the engineering part about how to construct the uh, instrument, they love that because they get to play with recyclable things that they find around their house, but at home they don't think that it's important, so they throw it away. But we collect it at school and they get to say, oh, this opium box could be a drum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, or uh, this bottle, if I put rocks in it, it could be a shaker. Fanny is such an outstanding teacher. To see her in the classroom with her students is so special because her students are just glued to her and they are so responsive to everything that she does in the classroom. It makes me feel really good because my whole process is them getting it. I teach music movement and theater games to preschoolers and I like those aha moments. At the end of the year we have an exhibit for all of the students to come to the Sheldon and to see how proud they are of their instruments and the hard work they put in is just so rewarding. For the students it's, it's a point of pride because they get to say, I painted that. 
you know, or this is my design. It's just like when they did their instruments, they would go by the table and say, oh, that's mine, <laughs> you know. What the kids have, have created, what uh, their imaginations have brought to creating musical instruments based on things that they know, but doing it in very, very unique and colorful ways. We had a student create a guitar using the hubcap from a car and stringing some strings to it and a neck and it was so creative, so fun and we've had so many creative instruments. One of the great resources we provide for teachers is that throughout the year we have professional development dedicated to the solid project. We take the teacher through a learning process to familiarize themselves with the, uh, with the curriculum and with the STEAM process. And we also have them go through a build on their own. So they've got uh, personal experience with what they're asking their students to do. What began in 2014 with the support of Boeing and partnership with the St. Louis Science Center, the Sheldon's SOLID program continues to grow. Almost 9,000 students went through the program and currently 65 schools are participants. One school, however, is taking SOLID beyond the classroom. We're so excited about the music wall that Julia Goldstein Early Childhood is putting on there schoolyard. It's such a fun project and such a unique idea to attach instruments to a, a permanent wall that students can just experiment with as they're out at recess. One of the reasons that we decided to do this project is first of all we saw a grant that said okay what do you want to do? And being the music teacher and then the art and the studio teacher and I got together, we said, oh, okay, we got a playground with new equipment on it. Let's build a sound wall, a music wall, that's what we call it. We sent out a letter to the parents and the parents were very receptive. We got so much stuff in. And so we put most of it up there. And the kids got a chance to learn about music notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, and they got to practice doing it. And they are the ones that painted the wall, put the words up there, and painted some notes. I say it's a work in progress, and it will forever be a work in progress because students leave and other students will come in and so we'll change our instruments and the new students will get a chance to learn about sound and vibration and frequency and how wonderful percussion instruments are to play. Next week, the St. Louis Art Museum reimagines its Oceanic Art Exhibit. Plus, her experience with long-term illness inspired her to write a story about staying positive through adversity. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.